Hi, welcome back to the next episode of the Keto Naturopaths. I'm Dr. Carl Goldcamp. Today we're going to go further with NAC and acetylcysteine and get into glutathione as a part one of what to do, and we'll get to part two later. So let's review a little bit. You know, why would you want to do this? What are the benefits of NAC? What are the benefits of glutathione? Why should you care individually? Okay. Well, basically, NAC and acetylcysteine, that's a precursor for glutathione, and we're all deficient in it. And these are some of the high points that we covered before. NAC slash glutathione, it's a, uh, a precursor for this antioxidant that's most powerful, one in your whole body, mostly in your liver. It helps with detoxification to prevent uh, kidney and liver damage, as exemplified with acetaminophen overdoses. And the World Health Organization even lists NAC, NAC, as being the antidote to acetaminophen or Tylenol toxicity. May improve psychiatric disorders, addictive behavior, help relieve symptoms of respiratory conditions such as cystic fibrosis, and it's a uh, mucolytic, so it breaks up the phlegm in your chest. It boosts brain health by regulating glutamate and replenishes glutathione. That's a big deal. It has a lot to do with addictions. It has a lot to do with ADHD. Improves fertility in both men and women. In women, famously with um, polycystic ovarian syndrome, and in men due to other issues. Stabilize blood sugar by decreasing inflammation of fat cells, reducing heart disease by preventing oxidative damage. NAC can reduce oxidative damage to your heart, which in turn can decrease your risk of heart disease. Absolutely true. Plenty of documentation on this. So it's a big deal. It's a, your ability to control inflammation. If you have uncontrolled inflammation, you have a lot of problems. The ability to boost glutathione levels may improve immune function. Okay, for your body to be able to make the amino acid cysteine, which it does in part, you need adequate amounts of folate, B6, and B12. Its effectiveness, NAC's effectiveness for you, really depends on your deficiency. As I've mentioned before, this couple, um, as a great example, that I recommended it for him, and after a month of him not getting any response at all, it was water off a duck's back, he had so much left over and he really had no need to continue it because it wasn't benefiting him. He gave it to his wife who was on two medications for schizophrenia and it transformed her life. So he never knew. She, I was not working with her, so it was not my business to intervene in that aspect, but an amazing story. We talked after that. Okay, these are some of the problems I mentioned before in terms of people having problems in making their glutathione, which was way down here. This, this is all part of your folic acid cycle and methylation cycle. And these are common, and this is actually just a superficial layer of me sort of going over all this, of some mutations. Superficial, but not for me. I have all three of these, and so does my wife. And people who do have this, and I'll show you more in a second, have difficulty making glutathione. So what does that mean? That means that they're gonna have a lot more oxidative stress if they have a poor diet. So they have to pay attention to these things to counter this. Okay, here's how that looks for these particular mutations from a genomic analysis company. I've just carved out these three, and this is not me. This is somebody else, but I wanted to show you MTHFR. There's basically two genes. There's plenty of, these are called polymorphisms, these mutations. And uh, this is the one that really slows things up a lot. And so having a homozygous, you're having both chromosomes, having this is really a problem. It doesn't mean you're going to be terrible. I mean, people survive and have these, clearly. And I have this, by the way. Um, it's just one traffic circle. So I refer to these, keeping it pretty superficial, as traffic circles. So if you have a problem here, uh, first traffic circle is going to get slowed up a little bit. Then you go on to the second traffic circle and then the third traffic circle. So when we look at this individual, he has problems certainly for the first two traffic circles and a partial problem for the other. His life, he's a diabetic and he comes from a multi-generation of addiction. That speaks to the genes. Here's the nutritional assessment. It's intracellular. It's from spectrocell. There's no secret here. But look what this person is deficient in. They're deficient in, borderline deficient in cysteine, 
borderline deficient in glutamine, both are components to make glutathione. That makes perfect sense. Serine is also involved in a few steps above, but this is, you can just add this together. It's a pretty easy uh, problem to look at, so to say. This is you and your mitochondria and how one generates energy from whether it's fats, carbohydrates, or proteins. So if this is me over here in my protein sparing modified fat. There's a ketogenic diet that's high fat, low carb. And here's your standard American diet of carbohydrates. We all eventually have to use the same Krebs cycle, the same ability to make energy. So when you look at the nutritional deficiencies here in red and the borderline or in yellow, you go, I don't think it's going to work that well. I think that just on the nutrition level, that's a problem. And we start adding in some of those mutations in addition to that. Now we have a double problem. Okay, this is another way of looking at folic acid cycle, methylation cycle, and where glutathione is made called transsulfuration. Don't get wrapped up in the terminology, and sorry I had to sort of say those three words to you, but it gives you the idea of these mutations, one, two, three, which we've already discussed, it's a problem. And coming down here, here's that other gene. Here's where glutathione is. So do you think that person would have a problem making glutathione? Absolutely they would. And this is just the same thing, a little bigger picture. And down here, it's still the same graph, just done differently. But I want to say NAC goes in here. Here's your cysteine. There's your glutathione. So there's only, between cysteine and glutathione, there's only one more enzymatic step. And some people do have a genetic problem here, so now they have to really double treat and really focus on this. They might even have to take glutathione straight as opposed to NAC. But now we've minimized the ability, all we can compensate at least in terms of ability to generate and create our own glutathione, that if we jump in here, like with me, NAC is very helpful. So why would we care? Back to this first question, why would you care? This isn't just intellectual curiosity and you're looking at the, for the next little supplement to make your life better. Well, in part, that's part of it. But what has happened since 1935, and you probably go back to the turn of the last century, is that our rates of chronic diseases have skyrocketed. So this is well documented from 35. In 1935, chronic disease and disability prevalent in the U.S. was about 7.5%. In the year 2000, 21 years ago, it was 45%. Now, in 2020, last year, it was 60%. That's huge. And so according to the, the CDC, they said, according to the CDC, chronic disease is caused by four factors. Tobacco use, lack of physical exercise, excessive alcohol, and poor nutrition. Well, um, let's check into that. I'm taking these four graphs from a guy, guy's blog named Jeff Knob. So I think he did a great job. I just shrunk them all down, put them on one pages, and added in my two cents. But he was smart enough to say, well, let's look at the data. Americans are smoking, smoking a lot less. So that part didn't make sense. Americans are, are exercising more. Adult, Ameri ex uh, adult American adults exercise more in 2018 than they did at any time in previous two decades. So that part doesn't make sense. Americans are not having more alcohol. Since 1980, they've dropped their amount of alcohol. Americans are eating healthier, and here's the sticker. It's the USDA Dietary Guidelines. So the Healthy Eating Index measures how the nation's food choices align with the guidelines. So according to the guidelines, we're doing pretty well. Maybe the guidelines. So something else is going here, but wait a minute, something else is going on. All right, why bother? Why bother to look at this? Because these are what that graph is made up of. Chronic diseases, heart disease, cancer, chronic lung disease, stroke, Alzheimer's, dementia, cognitive decline, diabetes, chronic kidney disease. These are some of those. You can go much more into the neurological as well. Okay, cancer rates have not increased have not decreased, sorry. Cancer rates have not decreased with, in the last 30 years. And you can go back to 1960s, hasn't changed. Why is that? With all our best healthcare in the whole world shenanigans, um, let's take a look at that. Okay, now we're looking at global cancer rates. And so this is, you know, it's no surprise the United States has the highest cancer rate of the whole world. It goes from 1990 to 
2017. This also comes from basically a CDC. So you can see with the rest of the world is just catching up to us over time. But what I want to point out is looking at this. So you can say, okay, well, I sort of knew we were, we were the worst. Uh, this is as of 2017, by the way. But here's the interesting thing. Now watch when I, I'm going to go back here. Watch how the top, this is the rate, uh, the percentage of cancer in a certain age group, right? So you have 70 year olds, 50 to 70, all ages. Uh, so what I want you to see is in here, younger down here, is how there's not more cancer in the older age group. There's more cancers happening younger. So just watch these different bars as I go across. So you'll see how more and more the bars start to crawl across the graph here. And that's what's happening is cancer is happening at an earlier age. Okay, let's look at a few more graphs that I'm sure you're familiar with if you've been watching some of our past videos. Obesity in America from 75 went from 11% to 42%. So obesity rates have risen 40% in the last 20 years. They have quadrupled since 1975. Anybody want to raise their hand and tell me why they think that has increased? Compare these side by side. Obesity next to chronic diseases since 1935. That's almost exactly the same graph. Slightly different time period, of course. Let's compare, and you've seen this before, American consumption of vegetable oil versus diabetes. Pretty similar. Hmm. Now let me make this pretty crystal clear to you. These are different papers I've put together, used their graphs, and there's the references down below. So you have omega-3, which is the omega index. Remember, just measuring EPA, DHEA as a percentage of fat in your red blood cell. They're saying the more you have of these two fats, omega-3s, in your red blood cell, the lower the risk of your cardiac death, sudden cardiac death. Pretty straightforward. Now let's look over excess of omega-6. This is on a per country basis, slightly different orientation. So when you look at the country with the highest concentration, so the HUFA is high, un, uh, high unsaturated fatty acids. So you have US and you have the highest rates of heart attacks. Okay, and here you have high omega-6 means omega-3 deficiency. That's true, but what is not written here is that having high omega-6 linoleic acid, it keeps omega-3 from actually being effective, as we've covered in previous videos. Not to redo that. Okay, so your glutathione levels are being depleted due to the rising oxidative stress of your daily life from, I believe, primarily processed foods, packaged foods, seed oils. I'm combining two different issues here and why glutathione is really the missing piece. We've talked about, you know, omega-6, omega-6. It's, yeah, we got that. It's been discussed in the last 50 years, certainly in the last 40 years. So that's not new. But the thing is, it's actually depleting your glutathione. The lack of glutathione is what is driving the chronic diseases and all the uncontrolled inflammatory processes. Okay, long-term uncontrolled systemic inflammation, uh, inflammation is the core of all chronic diseases and disorders. Two things determine your personal glutathione level, your ability to make it, of course, and your level of oxidative stress. Okay, sounds simple. Concept you need to know, oxidative stress. It actually is defined by glutathione, oxidized versus, uh, versus reduced. You want reduced. Reduced is the fireman. Reduced is the fire extinguisher in every room in your house. Reduced is having <clears throat> damp forest floors in the West. Right now, they're very dry. Just the dryness makes everything a risk. Lightning, a match, a cigarette butt. Okay, so before we go further, I want you to know just some of the components of glutathione. It's not highly technical, but I think it's important because it will give you an orientation for your own self. All right, so three components, glycine, glutamine, and cysteine. So cysteine is the least abundant amino acid in your cell and pretty much any cell. And the most important cell, uh, most important for cell survival and growth. In fact, it is the rate limiting step in the production of glutathione. Mentioned that before. Glycine is not that way. Glycine is the simplest amino acid and it's really interesting. They found this even in meteorites. They're called chondrites. These are meteorites that did not melt. 
you know, they were too small, so they basically hit the earth as they were found in space, and they found glycine in the meteor, found other amino acids as well. It's in every living thing from uh, every single cell organisms to humans. Also, it's a neurotransmitter in our body and other animals as too, pretty much through the whole phyla. Some think it is the basic unit of creating other amino acids, hence life. Glutamine is the most abundant amino acid in the body, yet considered essential, uh, conditionally essential at times after exhausting phys physical exertions. For instance, if you were to measure people's blood at the end of the Boston Marathon they just ran about a week ago, is that you would find they'd all be glutamine deficient right then. So it's used up very quickly. And if one had uh, burn victims, they're very depleted by glutamine as well. So like a marathon or an Ironman, severe trauma, burns, victims, post-surgery healing. Meat is considered the best source of glutamine and protein. Consumption of chicken, lamb, pork, beef can effectively improve glutamine levels. It's not just NAC and acetylcysteine, but cysteine in general. This came from perhaps the most prestigious, in my view, uh, European Scandinavian Institute called the Karol Karolinska Institute. And what it did, it measured dietary cysteine and other amino acids and stroke incidence in women. And what they found was these findings suggest that dietary cysteine specifically intake intake may be inversely associated with the risk of stroke. So cysteine specifically. So we talked about and said it's the rate limiting stuff to make glutathione. The intake is correlated with stroke, which is really in, uh, correlated with lack of glutathione. You're getting the picture now? Good. Okay. So everybody says, what's the highest foods in cysteine? Well, long story short, it's animal products. So if you're a vegetarian, block your ears. Yes, you could possibly get cysteine. You do need to do a lot of work to find out how to get that. And is it as um, absorbable? Is it as usable as animal products? The answer is it is not. But anyway, so one pork chop puts you over 200% of what you need for the day. Skirt steak, same thing. Lean chicken, same thing. Tuna, same thing. Uh, then it throws in, because it wants to be politically correct, about lentils and oatmeal. But one egg gives you half of what you need. Two eggs gives you 100%. It's primarily the egg white, by the way. And then they simply use Swiss, Swiss cheese. You can pick other cheeses. Specifically, you can get a whey cheese from Norway. Um, yai toast, or ekta yai toast, and, which is delicious. And that would be a whole different uh, perspective on that. Glutathione metabolism and its implications in health. This came from... Um, Texas A&M. This is pretty interesting because here's what they're going to say. I'm going to skip all this because I've already told you about the synthesis of glutathione is from glutamine, cysteine, and glycine. Yep, you got all that and the enzymes. But animal and human studies demonstrate the adequate protein nutrition is critical for the maintenance of glutathione maintenance. So I'm interpreting protein nutrition as primarily animal protein. You can think vegetarian protein if you want to do the work to make sure you got your amino acids. That's up to you. But it's complete when you use a whole food sources of protein. Glutathione plays a wicked important role in a lot of conditions. I'm not going to read that. This is the point. The reason the obnoxious yellow is used here. Glutathione deficiency contributes to the oxidative stress. I mentioned that before. So just being deficient makes it so like that dry forest floors in the western, uh, in the western United States, Canada, Washington, Oregon, British Columbia, all the forest fires. It's very dry, so suddenly they have a disproportional risk. That's how it is in the body as well. For an analogy, okay. How do you know if you have a glutathione deficiency? Well, the answer is you get tested, but we'll get into that later. Because the previously mentioned, because of all the previously mentioned, and because we are all aging, so we all need support. And as you get older, you actually produce less, or it's more difficult to produce adequate amount of glutathione. In part, you could say, well, as we get older, most adults don't eat enough protein, so that's what we've just learned right here is a contributing factor, wouldn't you think? All right, symptoms of insufficiency of glutathione. General insufficiency, lack of energy, joint muscle aches and pains, uh, lack of good cognition, foggy brain, low immunity, poor sleep. Severe insufficiency would be anemia. Wait a minute, I just said glutathione deficiency causes anemia. Absolutely. In a red blood cell, 
if you can't control the inflammation in red blood cell, you will have a higher rate of it breaking open, bursting. They call it hemolytic anemia, so breaking apart. And it clearly is, is, is more vulnerable, more of a, a thing that happens in people that have a, a vulnerability about that. Anyway, but that in itself, not being able to control inflammation in the red blood cell puts them at, at you at risk for anemia by the red blood cell breaking. All right, metabolic acidosis, frequent infections, seizures, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, loss of coordination, ataxia, Frederick's ataxia, ataxia, liver disease, heart attack, stroke. This is a little more academic, but it does say neurodegenerative disorders, same list, Huntington's disease, uh, ALS, MS, pulmonary disease, COPD, asthma, acute respiratory distress, immune disease, HIV, autoimmune. Remember we talked about that whole autoimmune epidemic, just like the obesity epidemic, cardiovascular disease, hypertension, myocardial infarction, cholesterol, oxidation, chronic age-related diseases, cataracts, macular degeneration, that's a hot topic now, hearing impairment, glaucoma, liver disease, cystic fibrosis, aging process itself. That's quite a list, and that came from NIH. Low glutathione in psychosis with schizophrenia and bipolar. We saw this at the last video. Boom, boom, boom. Very straightforward. And that came from the University of Texas. Now, pretty much the same study came from Tunisia. The last one was 2017. This is 2012. And I'm not going to read you this whole thing, but basically it said, we'll start here. It says, highlighting the glutathione deficit seems to be the contributing to these disorders and showing that it may be an important indirect biomarker of the oxidative stress for schizophrenia and bipolar. Oxidative stress, lack of glutathione. Let's do a comparison of omega-6 excesses, disorders and diseases we know are associated with high omega-6 to three ratio, and glutathione deficiency. See if there's any difference. Slightly from two different sources, so they're presented slightly differently. But here you have heart attack, stroke, cancer, obesity, insulin resistance, diabetes, asthma, arthritis, lupus, autoimmune, depression, schizophrenia, ADHD, postpartum depression, depression's on there twice, Alzheimer's. Uh, glutathione deficiency is lack of energy, joint pain for general, uh, cognition problems, foggy brain, low immunity, severe and Insufficiency is the anemia, the hem hemolytic anemia, or just anemia in general, uh, frequent infections, seizures, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, loss of coordination, liver disease, heart attack, and stroke. Looks like a match to me. Here's back looking at some of the labs. What we saw was those who have the highest omega-6, you might say, just look at the red, they have the highest problems. They certainly have the highest inflammation. They have the highest problems in all regards. This is what this panel looks like, the omega panel. You know, why are we looking at this again? Well, we're looking at, look down here. This is what you get from the lab. This happened to be Quest. Uh, you can get it from LabCorp as well. Down here, it says high risk. What is high risk correlated with? High risk is correlated with, and granted it's conservative, low omega-3, that's your omega-3 index, and a high omega-6. They're saying, this person's at, this is a stroke person gonna happen. Here. Low omega-3, high omega-6. Low omega-3, high omega-6. Over here. Low omega-3, high omega-6. All these are the high-risk clients, patients. Here is, here we is, here we are. The fat, the uh, omega-6, the soy, corn, vegetable oils that are, when you go out to eat, that's what your food is cooked in. When you buy your processed packaged foods, your Doritos, your potato chips, whatever it is, this is what you're getting. Hopefully you're not cooking it at home. Use coconut oil or lard. And this is how we get too much omega-6, too much arachidonic acid, too much inflammation. Again, the glutathione deficiency contributes to the oxidative stress. So what are you going to do about it? Well, the big picture is you can take supplements, you can change your diet, you can do things in a lifestyle. And we're going to go into this a little bit and um, some choices to be made. So if you feel like you have a deficiency from what we've talked about so far, what would you do? What would your strategy be? Let's start. Ways to increase intracellular glutathione you can do on your own. 
you can decrease the need for glutathione. How would you do that? Well, what that means decreasing your toxic load. The most obvious thing is limiting alcohol consumption. I'm so sorry to have to say that. I like my wine as well. Um, less obvious is decreasing exposure to your persistent organic pollutants. That's what POPs are. The primary source, which are conventionally grown foods. In other words, you're not eating, if you are eating your salads, they're not organic, and you're getting that daily dose of pesticides, little by little. Provide other antioxidants to decrease oxidative stress. We're going to get into this in the next video. A good example would be alpha lipoic acid, otherwise known as ALA. Think of, you might have heard of uh, mushroom poisoning. Um, Amanita mushroom poisoning is treated by ALA. Quercetin, turmeric, milk thistle, and we'll get into a few others. Uh, directly administer glutathione orally, topically, intravenous, intranasally, nebulized. Glutathione intravenously inhaled and ingested transnasally increases systemic levels, so it, that does work. IV glutathione, which you have to go to a special place for, is effective. It has a short half-life, though. That's what they do in emergency rooms. So oral administration, that would be oral glutathione does not increase red blood cell glutathione very well. So glutathione breaks down in the body. You can't digest it. It has to be uh, made in a special way that does get ingested. So glutathione by itself, to go eat foods that are high in glutathione, and there are no foods that are high in glutathione, uh, they all have some, it doesn't get digested. Liposomal, liposomal glutathione and acetyl glutathione are very effective. We'll get to that next video. Some specific nutrients to promote glutathione would be cysteine, of course. Availability is the rate-limiting step in the production of glutathione. While oral cysteine does not make it through the digestive tract, supposedly, whey, or NAC, right, is effective at raising levels. So whey, that means you get a lot of cysteine in whey. Whey is the, after cheese making, you have curds and whey. The curds are the cheese, and the whey is the runoff. That's what whey is. You also can have whey cheese for uh, yaitos and ectoyaitos from Norway. Doses vary from 1,000 milligrams a day to even more. Uh, foods that increase glutathione. Interesting thing is they did this test with smokers and they gave them almonds and they figured out 83 grams of almonds per day for, with smokers. Increased smokers by glutathione levels by 16%. The only bad thing about almonds, they taste great, I realize, um, is they're high in oxalates. So if you have a kidney problem, that's not something you're going to want to do. Meditation. Meditation. So meditators, those who actually practice meditation on a regular basis, have a 20% higher level of glutathione. It is something, and what you're doing is you're, you're lowering the need. You're lowering the need, lowering your oxidative stress by meditating. Okay, I'm going to end with this. So the health benefits of glutathione, NAC, are reduces oxidative stress and impacts cell damage. Impacts athletic performance. Didn't talk much about that, but you can see that, let's say, the marathon runners at the Boston Marathon, you've minimized their inflama inflammation, so they didn't have as much muscle damage post-race. Encourages healthy aging. Promotes balanced inflammatory response. Modulates insulin resistance. Promotes lean muscle mass. Protects from environmental toxins and free radicals through the liver detoxification. Supports detoxification. Till next time.